गुड मॉर्निंग क्लास इन प्रीवियस क्लास वी स्टडी अबाउट प्रोसेस राइट सो कैन एनी वन टेल मी वॉट आर द डिफरेंट स्टेट्स ऑफ ए प्रोसेस लेट्स रिवाइज द प्रीवियस क्लास देन वी विल स्टडी टूडेज क्लास इन प्रोसेस शेड्यूलिंग सो कैन एनी वन टेल मी वॉट आर द डिफरेंट स्टेट्स ऑफ ए प्रोसेस एनी वन जस्ट नेम ऑल दो स्टेट्स दैट वी हैव स्टडी इन प्रीवियस क्लास Uh, as we know that process is what a program in execution right a process is what a program in execution so what are the different states of a process in what is a process life cycle uh please tell me firoz alam are you there yes sir can you can you tell me the different states of a process yes sir Yes, please tell. So new. Uh, Ananya, yes, new. Ready or running? Right. Ready, running, right. Three now. Waiting or terminated? Very good, beta. Very good. Ananya is also written new, ready, running, termi uh, terminated, and waiting. Shreyas Mishra has written new, ready, running, waiting, terminated. Very good. Ah, uh, these are the five states of a process. And uh, what is the process is all about? It is a program in execution. That is, uh, whatever program you are writing, it is an passive entity. But when that program has started running, then we can think of it as a process. Uh, understand? So process is what a program in execution. And what are the different states? Whenever a new program uh, comes, uh, it is in a, a new state and it is admitted to the ready state. In a ready state, we are having a ready queue in which we are having all the processes um, that are waiting to be executed through the CPU. And then uh, we have a scheduler dispatch. Um, we will study today what is a scheduler and what is a dispatcher. but uh, in uh, that diagram we have seen that the uh, scheduler dispatch uh, are the responsible uh, tools that uh, make the process taken from the ready queue and uh, given it to the cpu for the processing and then we have seen that there may be some interrupt due to some reasons then that uh, running process can be again shifted to the ready queue and there is also possibility of that as some process need some input output activities like suppose it wants to write something on the uh, hard disk or it may take input from some other process then that has to wait then we have a waiting state also and once uh, that waiting period is over that means the uh, stuff it is waiting for has been uh, given it to then it will again uh, feedback given to the ready state and then a scheduler dispatch will select the new process from the ready queue and give it to the cpu and once the each and every process has been completed then the uh, it will go to the terminated state that is the process exited so in today's class we will study some more concept of process scheduling so we have a broad concept of what is the process uh, how it executed and what are the different states so today we will discuss about scheduler we will discuss about dispatcher and what are the different uh, scheduling algorithms uh, different type of scheduling algorithms this is the today's lecture topic so let's start today's class i am sharing my screen so that you can understand the concept of process scheduling okay your theoretical part has been over now from today we will having some interesting stuff of uh, operating system we will today discuss the concept of process scheduling and then we will go to, uh, to study the numericals of different type of cpu scheduling we are having so from today we onwards we are having some interesting stuff that you must understand uh, in process to better grasp the concept of operating system so let's start today's class that is process scheduling concepts uh, students please come on the time at 9 am otherwise it will be very clumsy for me to get you in into the classroom once the class has been started okay so process scheduling the objective of multi programming is to have some process running at all times to maximize cpu utilization uh, as the uh, heading says the process scheduling uh, why we need a process scheduling activity because uh, we need some uh, 
we we are having a lot of processes that wants to be executed through the cpu then only we can have some scheduling uh, criteria or some optimization criteria on the basis of which we select which process go next to the cpu and why we want the number of process to be executed in the cpu because cpu has an enormous computing power and uh, as you see that uh, right now i am using only two applications that is a uh, microsoft uh, powerpoint presentation and the zoom application along with the microphone but the cpu power is uh, much bigger than this it can execute much more task uh, concurrently but i am utilizing my cpu very less i can show you the cpu processing performance you can see here only 1.41 gb uh, cpu power i am using right now uh, for memory and for cpu usage it is only 35 to 40 percent as you can see that rest of the cpu power is lying idle so what is the uh, meaning of lying idle and we are using uh, only 40 percent resources of my cpu and the ram i am using uh, right now memory is 1.41 gb only and i am using some uh, three applications that is your Microsoft application, your and uh, Zoom application, and the microphone that we are using. So it is memory usage is 1.41 only, and the uh, CPU usage is 20 to 40 percent only. So this is the objective of the multi-programming, so that the CPU utilization is maximum. And the objective of time sharing is to switch the CPU among processes so frequently that users can interact with each program while it is running. Uh, as you know that uh, CPU can do one task at a time, but with the help of uh, time sharing, it switches so frequently that uh, you are not able to you know, distinguish that uh, which process is currently running in the CPU and which process is lying idle. So the objective of the time sharing is to switch the CPU among processes so frequently that users can interact with each program while it is running. There are three types of schedulers. First one is long-term scheduler. It's also known as job scheduler. And what is the purpose of using a, this job scheduler? It selects which process should be brought from the job pool and insert into the ready queue. Now here you can see that ready queue you are familiar with, but here is the new term that is called job pool. What do you understand by a job pool? Job pool are the pool of those jobs that uh, wants to take the use of CPU means number of uh, processes or number of application you are running right now in your computer system that firstly taken into the job pool means there is a pool of jobs that wants to take control of the CPU but which processes go to the ready queue it will be decided by the long term scheduler only and uh, number of processes that are into the ready queue it decides the degree of multi-programming means only those processes which are in the ready queue uh, that can have the uh, advantage to use the cpu at any point of time until and unless a process is, in, is not into the ready queue that cannot um, go to the cpu uh, at any point of time so which uh, scheduler will decide uh, scheduler you can understand that it is going to schedule something right scheduler and what it is going to schedule it is going to schedule which process is going to execute when and when a process is only executed when it is in the ready queue and which scheduler will decide which process should we go to into the ready queue this is the long term scheduler and this is also known as job scheduler so what is the job of a long term scheduler it select which process should be brought from the job pool and insert into the ready queue as I told you that long-term scheduler controls the degree of multi-programming. What? It controls the degree of multi-programming. Degree means uh, how many number of processes currently running on a CPU right now. So a long-term scheduler controls the degree of multi-programming. Uh, uh, can anyone tell me the difference between parallel execution and concurrent execution? What is the difference between parallel execution of a process and a concurrent execution of a process? Is there any difference so, between? Uh, yes. So execution of program one by one is parallel, I think. Uh, one by one is parallel. 
Yeah, uh, yes, sir. Do you have seen two parallel trains running? Uh, sir, two yes, parallel one trains. Concurrent. Then uh, and... two trains are running uh, side by side. Then we can say that trains are in parallel, right? How can it be yes, one sir. by one? Understand? Uh, those yeah. uh, we can say that trains are running parallelly means two trains are going uh, simultaneously in one direction then we can say that the uh, trains are running parallel right they are not one by one uh, think properly no need to hurry just think about it what is the meaning of concurrent execution and parallel execution of something uh, I'm asking this question because we will uh, uh, take and took this topic a later point of time, but I am just uh, giving you some uh, kind of like, uh, oh, what is concurrent execution? Or what is parallel execution? There may be some difference or there may be same thing uh, so that you can go and study these kinds of concepts because you must uh, have to aware about these things. Prakar Shukla has written, uh, to execute two program at once, to execute two program at once is parallel execution, while to execute one after another is concurrent execution. Uh, Prakhar, you are absolutely right, but you have to elaborate your answer so that we can understand. Otherwise, uh, this answer can be think of as a sequential execution, right? When you are saying that you are executing one after another, this is kind of a sequential execution, I guess, right? Once you completed one process, then there is an another process, right? Then what it is about? It is a sequential execution. Uh, by writing... Sir, using multiple CPUs uh, is a parallel execution. Uh, using multiple what? CPUs. CPU. No, this is uh, not about multiple CPU. This is all about uh, on the single CPU. We are having concurrent execution and a parallel execution kind of thing. Can we have on a single CPU? Or do we need a multiple CPU to have parallel execution and concurrent execution? Okay, let's uh, discuss in, in uh, down the line. And I am just giving you this question so that you can go and search on the internet or uh, on, on the books and gain some more knowledge about this. The point is, if I am giving you some tasks and you go to find out the answer of those questions, you maybe not succeed in finding those answers, but the time you are putting to finding that answer, you may you are must be learning something. You must have learned about one to two hours on the internet you put your efforts to find the answer. So maybe you did not get the answer, but you must have learned something else that is beneficial for you. I am asking you a question. That means I have an answer for that. I will tell you when the point comes to let you understand about the, this concept, but I, I will be more than happy if you find the answer yourself, then I can say that you are using your knowledge, that means you are reaching the state of a wisdom when you understand how to apply your knowledge. You each and every student know each and everything about what we are studying right now. We are studying only applications. You are having knowledge about each and everything. But when you are having the right direction to apply those knowledge, then you becoming a right candidate to grasp the things. Okay, so let's move on the topic once. Uh, what we are studying, we are studying schedulers. Uh, these are three types. First one is long-term scheduler. And what is the job of long-term scheduler? It controls the degree of multi-programming, right? And from where it picks the process, it picks the process from the job pool and send it to the ready queue. Now we, second one we are scheduler we are having is short-term scheduler. What is the job of a short-term scheduler? Uh, it select the process from the ready queue and it allocates it to the CPU. As you can see, there is one job pool. A long-term scheduler pick the process from the job pool and there is another thing is called a ready queue. It put the, take, a, take the process from job pool and given in the ready queue. Now in from ready queue, there is short-term scheduler. It taken the process from the ready queue and there is a CPU. It allocates it to the CPU. Very easy concept about the short-term scheduler, it is also known as CPU scheduler. 
So what is the job of CPU scheduler? It selects which process from the ready queue should be executed next and allocates it to the CPU. Now you are seeing, please uh, understand this very clearly that here what it is written here, which process means there are multiple processes are there in the ready queue and uh, uh, short term scheduler is going to decide which process or uh, suppose there are 10 processes in the ready queue and uh, what on what merit this short term scheduler is deciding which process will go to the CPU to execute. So there are number of CPU scheduling algorithm which decides uh, the merit on which basis short term scheduler uh, take the processes from the ready queue and send it to the where CPU for the execution. So till now we have studied two schedulers. First one is long term scheduler. Uh, which controls the degree of multiprogramming and degree of multiprogramming depends upon the number of processes are lie in the ready queue. And there is another short term scheduler. It, this is also known as CPU scheduler. And what is the job of CPU scheduler? It allocates the processes, the CPU from taken from the ready queue. It select which process from the ready queue should be executed next and allocates it to the CPU. There is another one scheduler which is called medium term scheduler. This comes between the long term scheduler and the short term scheduler. And uh, why we need a medium term scheduler? The purpose of using medium term scheduler, suppose uh, as I have shown you my CPU usage is 40%. Suppose uh, right now I am using three applications only. Suppose I have started using a 20 application or 50 applications simultaneously. Now the CPU usage has gone to 90%, 99%, right? Then some of the my user applications might be slow because CPU is not able to give proper time to each and every application simultaneously, right? So in that case, either I, I have two options. Either I have to close some of the applications I am not using or having the less priority right now. Suppose I have open MS Word also in background. I am writing on that something, but as the class is started, I have I don't need that MS Word document. I have to close that or I have just leave it as it is. But suppose uh, there is some problem with this PowerPoint presentation because of the uh, uh, higher usage of CPU, then I have to close uh, some low priority process that is my MS Word that is uh, I am not using right now, then my CPU usage will come down. So uh, how this will happen, this will be done with the help of medium term scheduler, the process is swapped out. That is it taken from the CPU, it is in the CPU for some execution, but uh, as the multiprogramming is very high, so CPU usage is very high and all other processes are slowing down, then we, what we do, the process is swept out to reduce the degree of multiprogramming in some cases and is later swept in once other process has completed their execution by the medium term scheduler. The scheme is called swapping. We will talk about swapping and swapping concept in detail when we will study memory management concept of operating system. So let's have a diagram of medium term scheduler. Here you can see that process are putting into the ready queue. It goes to the CPU and suppose uh, uh, it is a single process at a time in the CPU, it will execute completed its execution it will end. Uh, either it will CPU have uh, that process has to wait for some input output then will be sent to the waiting state that is in the waiting queue and once it completed it will feed back to the ready queue. And there is another uh, part of this diagram for the medium term scheduler means uh, partially executed processes that are running into the CPU that will be taken out from the CPU and place in somewhere else with the help of medium term scheduler and once the CPU usage has come down then we will swap in those partially executed processes into the ready queue and then once again the short term scheduler will decide which process from the ready queue will go to the CPU. So uh, there is a very uh, general question asked about the scheduler that what is what are schedulers what is the purpose of using schedulers what are the different type of schedulers and what is the difference among 
long term scheduler short term scheduler and medium term scheduler in vivo also most of the time examiner ask you that uh, which scheduler uh, controls the degree of multi programming then you now you must have understand that which scheduler controls the degree of multi programming this is the long term scheduler understand and uh, what uh, what is the job of short term scheduler short term scheduler takes the process from the ready queue and uh, and actually it selects the which process will go to the cpu from the ready queue based upon some algorithm we will study about those algorithm later on and on what are the merits on which it decides which process is going to take the cpu control so this is all about schedulers let's uh, understand about the context switch what do you understand by context switch as we have seen that uh, in cpu uh, there are multiple processes are uh, waiting for uh, waiting for to take the control of cpu for execution but due to some input output where they have to wait into the ready queue or there must be some interrupt and they have to come back into the ready queue and then another process is running into the cpu so uh, these are the things Uh, that uh, one process has some um, partially executed and that partial executed process has come once again after some point of time and before that a new process has given the control of the cpu then we have to switch between processes with, with along with the context also means how much percentage of that process has been completed where is that program control uh, uh, i guess everyone has uh, remember that pcb what is the full form of pcb in context of processes please write in the chat box what is the full form of pcb pcb in context of process what is the full form of pcb please write in the chat box uh, and uh, do you remember in previous class we have studied pcb and i told you that pcb is the soul of process if uh, a question comes uh, very good priyam uh, avanish firoz correctly right and shreyas also told that process control block very good so process control block what are the ingredients there is a um, process what are the ingredients of process control block what are the ingredients can anyone tell me what are the ingredients of process control block uh, what are the ingredients of a process control block very good pooja process control block and what are the ingredients of process control block come on uh, just tell 2 to 3 what are the ingredients of process control block come on very good priyam has written uh process state process number program counter very good program counter process number process state pooja priyam very good program counter okay i understand that you are revising each and everything okay i understand so what i am telling you that uh, the pcb which have each and everything about the process uh, it have the program counter process state each and everything in the pcb so whenever a context switch happen that uh, ha con we have to uh, uh, take the state of a process from where we have finished uh, we have uh, taken uh, leave that process and from where we have taken it right now so let's understand what is a context switch when cpu switches to another process the system must save the state of the old process and load the saved state for the new process how you are going to save the state of a process and what do you understand by the state of the process uh, i guess uh, in object oriented programming you have learned about the state of an object right where what is the state of an object this is the same thing we are talking about state of the process means um, what is the current status of a process how much it is completed where is that program counter uh, what are the uh, uh, variables and uh, other things they are using what is their values what is the register values 
what is the process number currently running these are the states of a process so whenever a context switch happen the cpu the system must save the state of the old process and load the saved state of the new process as you can see here that uh, when uh, uh, there is a transition period that you are moving from one process to another that transition period that is context switch it is an overhead why it is an overhead because our cpu our system is not doing any useful work uh, in that transition period because you are just stating saving the state of uh, that running process and loading the state of a new process that wants to take control of the cpu so context switch time is an overhead because system is not going to do any useful work and that overhead time of context switch it all depends upon the hardware it only hardware decide that how much time it will take in by it to context switch between the processes and there are two type of scheduling cpu scheduling one first one is preemptive scheduling and another one is non preemptive scheduling of uh, we have seen that what is the scheduling cpu scheduling why we need cpu scheduling because number of process are running in the cpu at it at a time so we need a scheduling which process must take the control of the cpu which process go next to for execution and then we have seen three type of schedulers long term scheduler short term scheduler and medium term scheduler right then what we have seen we have understand about the context switch that there must be an overhead whenever you switch between the processes and then we have seen two type of scheduling that is preemptive and non preemptive preemptive means you can preempt at any point of time means uh, it can be stop and then start stop start but what is non preemptive it is like uh, you cannot uh, pause at any point of time it has to start and stop only and then when stop it it will stop only when it is completed otherwise it comes under the category of preemptive so let's see what are the preemptive and non preemptive scheduling cpu scheduling decisions may take place when a process first one switches from running to waiting state uh, i guess everyone must have remember about five states what are the in starting i have also asked new state ready state running state waiting state and the terminated state now please understand very properly that whenever you are switching from the running to waiting state there is a context switch right uh, when you are switches from running to ready state switches from waiting to ready state and terminates these are the four scenarios and let's find out when it comes under the category of preemptive scheduling and when uh, what are the scenario falls under the category of non preemptive scheduling so the scheduling under point number 1 and 4 is called non preemptive scheduling means uh, you are not uh, pausing the process at any point of time it is either has to completed or has to wait indefinitely so as you can see terminate that process can only terminate means it cannot be paused and it can go from running to waiting state and there is no possibility that it can again come back to the ready queue so either it has completely terminated or it has to wait indefinitely means it it has not gonna take again its chance in future at any point of time so this kind of scheduling is called non preemptive that means you cannot pause and start once again now this is kind of some uh, downloads uh, you must be have uh, faced in your life that some downloads can be paused and then start once again from where you are pausing and some downloads uh, they just break whenever you are pausing those downloads that means res resumable capability is not there in those downloads means they are a single file and there are no some uh, a resumable capability in those downloads in suppose at 90% of downloading you uh, pause that downloading but you cannot resume from 90% to 100% because it has to uh, break it has break the uh, packets that are transferred from the server it has to start it from the start also starting so this kind of uh, scheduling is called non preemptive and what and rest of the 
scheduling is preemptive. Like you can pause and start, you can pause and start, like running to ready state, waiting to ready state, and of course, running to waiting state and terminates. These are the characteristics of a preemptive scheduling. Now, uh, idea is very clear, preemptive, you can pause and start, pause and start. What about non preemptive? You cannot have the facility of resume. You cannot resume a process once you pause it. Pause means it is going to terminate, right? So two type of scheduling, CPU scheduling. First one is preemptive and second one is non preemptive. And there is another concept of dispatcher. We have studied uh, scheduler and now dispatcher. Uh, you have must remember that diagram that from ready state to running state, we have scheduler dispatch, right? So we have understand the concept of scheduler. Now we will study the dispatch. Uh, Krishnam has asked a question, how can process come back from running state to ready state? Uh, a process can come back from running state to ready state. We will discuss when we study the CPU scheduling algorithm. Uh, there is a mechanism uh, on which basis we pause, uh, say like a medium term scheduler you have seen that a process running into the cpu and we have taken that partially executed process into the memory and then put it into the ready queue right so this is how a process can come back to the ready queue from the running state it may be either waiting for some input output activity or it may be have some interrupt from the hardware or it may be some interrupt from the user. So a running process can be sent back to the ready queue, either through the waiting queue or directly from running state to ready state. So let's study what is dispatcher. Uh, it comes under the picture when a short term scheduler picks the process from the ready queue and give it to the CPU. Now, dispatcher modules gives control of the CPU to the process selected by the short term scheduler. This involves Switching context, switching to user mode, jumping to the proper location from where the program to start, jumping to the proper location in the user program to start that program. So to take the, give the control of the CPU to the process selected by the short term scheduler, what are the activities done by the dispatcher? These are the switching context, switching to user mode, jumping to the proper location in the user program to restart that program. And of course, there is also a dispatch latency. Latency means lagging, means at, at time it required to do all these things. Time required by the dispatcher to do switching context, switching to user mode, and jumping to the proper location in the user program to restart that program. And this latency is what dispatch latency it is called and time it takes for the dispatcher to stop one process and start another. So why time taken by the dispatcher? It has to do all these three jobs, switching context, switching to user mode and jumping to the proper location in the user program to restart that program. We are having five scheduling criteria on which basis your scheduler will decide which process will go into the CPU for execution. First one is CPU utilization. We want the keep CPU as busy as possible. There is a waiting time uh, uh, as we understand that number of processes are waiting in the ready queue for their turn. So that some of period of the time in which a process is waiting in the ready queue is called waiting time. And there is a turnaround time. This is the uh, total time uh, process uh, taken to complete its execution means it, this is the time interval between the completion of the process and the time it is submitted into the ready queue. So in numericals, when we find the waiting time, you have to find the sum of the periods and the time in which a process waits in the ready queue. And when we do the numerical on the turnaround time, you have to simply find the time the process has completed and minus it with the time it is submitted to the ready queue. And then we have throughput. Throughput, as you are very well aware, that this is the number of processes that completed by the CPU in unit time. We have also a response time. A response time is uh, just like uh, you have, suppose you have asked any question in Google Classroom, and uh, the time taken by me to read that question and answer that question is called the response time. 
suppose you have asked question yesterday and i have seen your question today only uh, suppose yesterday you asked that question at 7 pm and today i see that question in 7 am and answer that question so that time uh, response time was 12 hours right so uh, same case is here the amount of time it takes from when a request was submitted until the first response is produced so with the help of these five criteria we can derive the optimization criteria from this scheduling criteria what things we want to optimize and what are the criteria we want to minimize can you suggest that what are the criteria we want to maximize and what are the criteria we want to minimize suppose response time is 24 hours or some two days or some four days then it will be good for you that you have asked question uh, today and the response given by me after one week then uh, it is just like uh, waiting for some a lot of time then this is not good right we want to reduce the response time and what is the throughput Supp suppose in sense of me that the number of question uh, solved by me at unit time is this is the throughput of me so uh you uh, wants the teacher asks a num uh, solve a number of questions of his students so the throughput must be the maximum right what about turn around time this is the total time taken by the cpu or by me to solve your problem so this must be very low right and waiting time this is the time you are waiting into the classroom to ask the question to the teacher so this also must be the low and cp utilization you want to take uh, full advantage of the teachers in the classroom so you want to utilize the cpu at most means this is a 40 minute 40 minute lecture and i am utilizing my whole time to go deliver you the knowledge which is required to understand the topic very clearly so cp utilization is at maximum i am not doing any other thing right now i am just focusing on you only to let you understand the concept of the cpu scheduling criteria so let's see the optimization criteria what are the optimization criteria what are the things we want to maximize uh, two things we want to maximize that is cp utilization and throughput a very common sense that you want to maximize the cpu utilization and the throughput and what are the things we want to minimize uh, we of course want to minimize the waiting time turn around time and what response time minimize the turn around time waiting time and the response time so these are the things we want to minimize okay so there are some questions on today's topic explain the importance of context switching explain various criteria for cpu scheduling differentiate among short term medium term and long term schedulers list various optimization criteria i am very quickly revising today's class uh, what is process scheduling whenever we are having a number of processes in in the cpu for execution then we need a scheduling of these processes and uh, we want a uh, cpu as busy as possible and there are three type of scheduler that is long term scheduler which controls the degree of multi programming short term scheduler allocates the uh, process from the ready queue to their cpu and then medium term scheduler which uh, reduce the degree of multi programming and then context switch context we have seen that the time taken from one process to another then preemptive scheduling and non preemptive scheduling and then dispatcher we have study and then five scheduling criteria and then optimization criteria these the things we have studied today so in uh, next class we will have some numerical on the cpu scheduling algorithm like first come first serve shortest job first priority scheduling algorithm till then keep studying i will upload today's class lecture note on the google classroom